The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your Son, so that your Son may glorify you. Just as you gave him authority over all people, so that your Son may give eternal life to all you gave him. Now this is eternal life, that you should know you, the only true God, and the one whom you sent, Jesus Christ. I glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work that you gave me to do. Now glorify me, Father, with you, with the glory that I had with you before the world began. I revealed your name to those whom you gave me out of the world. They belonged to you, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you gave me is from you, because the word you gave me I have given to them. And they accepted them and truly understood that I came from you. And they believe that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for the ones that you have given me, because they are yours, and everything of mine is yours, and everything of yours is mine. And I have been glorified in them. And now I will no longer be in the world, but they are in the world, while I am coming to you. The Gospel of the Lord. I know every time I read John's Gospel today, no exception, it is always reminding me of Abbott and Costello and who's on first. You know, you got to really pay attention and you really got to read it slow <laughs> in order to follow step by step what is uh, being conveyed to us. And as we, we look at the, the Gospel in particular today, Although the exact words may not be these, there's a, a particular theme, a particular reminder for us, and that particular theme, that particular reminder is that God intended the human race to be united. God intended the human race to be united. We don't hear those exact words, but that's really true, those words and that reading what we're reminded, and that ultimately Jesus came so that we might be one, and through the scripture today again we hear that Jesus prays for that unity. Yet, especially if you watch the 6 o'clock or 11 o'clock news, if you make it till 11 o'clock, you know, what do we hear of division and strife? We know that the human race is to be united. Jesus prayed for that unity. Jesus prayed for that peace, but, but also often, day in and day out, we hear of division and strife. And maybe we can kind of scratch our heads a little and begin to question, you know, what is it, what is it going to take to finally bring unity and peace? What is it finally going to take to bring that? And we're really given two answers today that are very basic and simple, and as basic and simple as they are to understand is probably how difficult they are to actually bring to life in our lives. But two basic answers that are required for that unity and peace. The first answer is prayer. Easy to understand, prayer. And what do we hear? <clears throat> first of all, in the Acts of the Apostles, we hear that the 11 apostles, of course, Judas already has died, so the 11 remaining apostles, along with Mary and other disciples, go back after the moment of the ascension. They go back to that upper room in Jerusalem, and 
They're in that upper room, and what are they doing? They are devoted to prayer. Devoted to prayer. They're awaiting the power of the Holy Spirit. And really the key word to focus on is devoted. As we reflect in our own lives, are, are we devoted to prayer and what that word truly means to be devoted to prayer. And we go to the gospel and we hear in the gospel that uh, Jesus prays for his apostles. We hear very clearly of his prayer again. And so the simple question today really is, how do you pray? And how devoted are you in that prayer? That key word. I hope we do not have to ask the question, do you pray? I hope we don't have to ask that question. I trust we don't because you're here, so I trust we don't have to ask that question. But I remember uh, many years ago directing one of our youth retreats over at the Columban Center when we had the retreat house there on the lake shore, beautiful place. And uh, it was a weekday, and I remember as the teenagers were on a break, I happened to be walking by the main door, and, and this older gentleman walked in, and he asked for Monsignor Wall, who was the director of the house, and, and he said, well, Monsignor isn't here right now. It's his day off. And uh, the man said to me, he said, well, you know, I, I often stop to talk to with Monsignor Wall to get some advice and direction, but since he's not here, I guess you'll have to do. Great way to win friends and influence people. And uh, so we sat, <clears throat> and I remember him talking about his great desire to pray. And he used beautiful imagery and language that he always thirsts to pray, he desires to pray. And, and after he talked for a few minutes about this thirsting and this desiring, as he paused, I looked at him and I, I said, well, do you? And he said, well, do I what? And I said, well, do you pray? He said, you're talking about a thirst and a desire, but are you actually doing it? And he said, oh, I'm far too busy to actually pray. Isn't that the story of a lot of our lives? And uh, that devotedness, that devotion should be at the top of the list, really, just as eating, drinking, and sleeping, we should be devoted to our prayer. How is it that we pray? A challenge that I, I often see for us in, in the life of prayer is the fact that we, we probably don't grow in our prayer life like we should. You know, we, we often, many of us, pray as we did in elementary school. You know, as much as our bodies grow and our minds grow and our emotions grow and, and all of the elements of who we are as a person grows, do, do we allow our spiritual life to grow and our experience of prayer to grow? Do you pray like you did as a child or has that really matured and developed? An important question to ask. You know, there are many ways to pray. In some beautiful ways, <clears throat> as a teenager, a young adult, an adult to pray. One beautiful way to pray is Lectio Divina, sacred reading. You know, it's been my custom since I'm here to give you books at Mother's Day, Father's Day, Christmas, and Easter. That's to get you to do Lectio Divina, <laughs> to do sacred reading, and not to read these books just as you would a novel, but to read them in very small snippets and, and maybe, God forbid, read it a couple times, these little snippets, and, and then sit and reflect, well, what is this saying to me in my life? Lexio Divina, reading sacred reading, if it be the scripture, if they be the books we have here, writings of the saints, the lives of the saints, to really reflect and say, where, where is my life in their life? Where is my life in what I'm reading here with the Lord? Adoration, a beautiful way, a gift we have here at St. Greg's. And, you know, so often people say, well, I don't know what to do when I go there. Well, that's the beauty of adoration. You don't have to do anything. You just show up, you know. You just go there. That's all you have to do. Allow the Lord to guide and direct your prayer. You know, as now St. John Paul II was once asked, how does and for whom does the Pope pray? And John Paul II responded, I don't know. He said, if you really want to know how and for whom the Pope prays, you better ask the Holy Spirit, because when the Pope prays, he simply places himself in the presence of the Spirit and the presence of God, 
and he allows God to direct the prayer. Adoration, you don't have to worry about doing anything, just go there, and uh, the Lord will take care of the rest. Beautiful way to pray. Bible bingo is a wonderful way to pray. We teach our teenagers Bible bingo. If you were at one of the Masses I had on Ascension Thursday, I talked about Bible bingo and told you a story. I'll tell you another one. Bible bingo is basically this. You close your eyes, holding the Bible, and you say, Lord, I want to listen to you now. And uh, then uh, you open the Bible with your eyes closed. You put your finger down on a passage, and you, and you read it. And you reread it, you re-reread it, and you reflect about what was the Lord saying. I told one story about Bible bingo. I'll tell another one today. A number of years ago, a young man who was coming to me for a spiritual direction, a Marine, so a tough guy, you know, the elite member of the Marine Corps, he, he came for some spiritual guidance, and I taught him Bible bingo, and we, we did that together in my office. And... Uh, when I opened the Bible and put my finger down on the passage, it was a tough passage. It was an Old Testament passage about um, a war and bloodshed and this particular river. And I, I really was thinking to myself, I should have stayed awake in class that day because I don't know what to say about this passage, you know. And, uh, and I didn't have to worry when I opened my eyes and looked at him after reflecting for a few minutes. He, he was crying bitterly and uh, I asked him why and he said I was there so I was in that river that I saw people die there and that exact passage which we opened with closed eyes and put our finger down on opened the door for him for healing of what he needed as he served our nation so proudly as a marine Bible, bingo, beautiful way to pray. Meditation and contemplation, sometimes people get these goofed up. They think it's the same thing. They're two different things. Meditation is something human. You use a human image, a human concept, a, a human way of reasoning, and really focus on that and allow that to bring you into a prayer. And really, uh, a beautiful outcome of meditation often is contemplation. And what is contemplation? Contemplation is not something that we inspire, but it's inspired and given to us divinely. It's produced by God. We can't initiate that. It's a gift in prayer where we know without doubt we're with the Lord in conversation. I hope you've experienced that. I have. When you get so deep into your prayer that you know without doubt that you are in a conversation with God. You completely are unaware of anything going on around you. And when that moment is over, you come back and you realize maybe some of what was discussed, maybe not, but you know without doubt you are in the presence of the Lord. Prayer is one of the ways that we bring that healing to division and strife, that unity and peace. The second answer is the hour. And... Uh, John's Gospel, you know, uses this term, the hour, I believe it's 46 times. Lucky for you, there's 930 Mass, so we can't go through for all 46 moments in John's Gospel. But the first time we hear the hour is in the moment of Cana, when, you know, Mary comes to Jesus and says, uh, they have no more wine. And Jesus says, woman, how does this concern of yours affect me? My hour has not yet come. Well, on one hand, you know, if I would have called my mother woman, I would have been the guest of honor at the funeral parlor, I think, you know. But, of course, Jesus is using the exact same term used for Eve in the Old Testament book of Genesis, and so Mary is the new Eve. And uh, what does he do? He's, say, he's saying, my hour is not come, meaning the, the manifestation of God has not yet come. But in that moment of Cana, he does turn the water into wine, that manifestation, the first miracle takes place. And then we hear the final time of the hour. The hour is not only upon us, it is now here, referring to his passion, his suffering, his death, and ultimately his resurrection. How is it that we really come to bring healing to division? to bring unity and peace. It's to join Christ in the hour. 
You know, all of us have those moments in life where we're called into that hour. Sometimes we deflect that moment. We don't want to be suffering in the hour as the second reading calls us to suffer. Sometimes we avoid the hour. Sometimes we want peace at any price, so we do not speak the truth. But that second reading today calls us those moments, those opportunities we have to stand and, <clears throat> stand and live for our faith. Those are moments that we're called to enter into the hour and to suffer along with Christ, maybe be crucified along with him, ultimately to rise and understand the meaning of the resurrection. Today as we prepare for Pentecost Sunday, we simply reflect where we are in prayer and where we are in entering into the hour.